hey, deserving listeners, love is blind. Let's watch and see what comes flying out of my face. <laughs> what this show provokes me to say. Let's watch. It was, it was so strange for me. It was odd. You were the only person who wasn't coming up to me, like being like loving. Yeah, that's not even true. We saw a scene where that was happening. And there were plenty of the couples were not engaging in a constant lovey uh, embrace. We saw Jeremy and Laura actually not have any of that, and they were having a kind of an odd fight at the end. So it's unfortunate that she can't at least question this perception. I think she believes this. I, I don't think she's lying or exaggerating. I think it feels this way to her because it's a hallmark of this kind of problem. It, it, to give it a label, it could be interpreted as as preoccupied attachment. You know, there's other personality issues that I, we can go into, but in general, preoccupation, meaning that the individual experienced enough chaos and uncertainty of attachment, attunement, and security as a child that they developed a defense of one, pursuing people and leaning in and assuming that they have to kind of play a game in order to get people to love them because they're not inherently lovable. And they also learn neurologically to amp up their emotions. They also learn that in order to really make people love me, I have to be very convincing and I have to really go after them. I have to really be very emotive, maybe accusatory, hostile, angry. I, I got to really like press the issue constantly. And I have to be hyper vigilant about whenever there's a possible abandonment. You know, we're we're seeing signs of that. We don't know if that's what's happening. And I could just be completely wrong. Maybe Jimmy was on his road to cheating and and I'm just biased. I don't know. What do you think? I kissed you more than anybody kissed their woman and I. I just felt really confident about where we were and the connection we have to the point where I didn't have to be by your side all night. So I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. I don't need you by my side, but like, that's why this is. <laughs> it's literally what you were saying. Yeah, it, it can be very confusing if you're in his shoes. You're like, so which one is it? I, I'm i never by your side or you don't want me by your side. You know, it's, it's this, because what's happening is she has a feeling that she doesn't know why she's having it. And the feeling is overwhelming. It's a feeling of fear and hurt. And apparently, at least in this moment, she doesn't have any insight into that. And, and so none of the things that he's saying is reassuring to her because what would reassure her is really strong evidence that he is dedicated to her and he loves her. And the fastest way typically is that he just goes to her and hugs her and kisses her or holds her hand or, and just get away from the detail conflict. And you don't have to agree with everything. Like, yep, I did all those things. You just be like, yeah, I'm sorry. You know, just say, you know, I, I, I hear you. Then typically, if you play your cards right, then the Chelsea's of the world will eventually come around. They'll regulate, they'll feel better. And hopefully, and they often will say, and they're at least in their head, yeah, I was really triggered or I was exaggerating. <laughs> I was looking at everything as glass half empty and he did kiss me last night. So what was I thinking? And then hopefully says to Jimmy, by the way, I was exaggerating last night. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, so trying to argue with her in this moment, if I'm guess, if I'm reading it right, is it's, it, it just, it could be rational and fair to do that, but she can't feel and think rationally until she feels secure. And all the debating just either keeps her at the same level of anxiety or makes it worse. It's very sad to me because like, it was just a very- How is this sad? This is like going out with our friends and you know where I stand. Like I, I'm the luckiest person. I'm the happiest person here. I'm sorry you feel that way. It's really interesting that, so as a clinician and as a professor, uh, the data that I have, you might think like, if you even respect a little bit of the things that I say clinically, how did I get there? How did I learn that, that stuff? Well, I learned theory and research, but really 90% of it is because I would see it, not only clinically in my office, but I would also see it in my own life, myself. I would observe myself, oh, I'm doing that thing. And so 
as clinicians and as, as a professor trying to teach this to people, I have to describe things. I have to provide vignettes and descriptions, right? But we almost never get the opportunity to see in real time as it is happening. And on a lot of reality TV, they are scripting a lot of things. And this is not that. I mean, it could be, but if it is, it's a damn good job. But I don't think this is scripted. I think this is actually happening, you know? And to get that truthful, real scenario that exhibits something that I have been trying to describe to people, my supervisees and my students, for 25 years, it's just, it's so interesting. And, you know, you would think that in the field of psychology, we would have film or examples or videos or something. And the best that we can do ethically is find actors. And actors are never close to the reality. It's always obvious. Or there are certain things that you can act maybe close, like to be avoidant, because all you have to do is just sit there. But to do this kind of thing, it, it it's... It, there's, it's sort of like when you see a computer generated image of like a celebrity, like they try to recreate Tom Hanks in Polar Express. Uh, an alien might not see the difference, but we're so attuned and we're so experienced looking at human faces that we can tell it's like, oh, there's something off with that. And it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't make you feel comfortable. Well, a lot of the vignettes and the examples are kind of like that to experts like me. Where it's like, oh, that's, that's not quite right. It's sort of like if you're a physician and you watch shows like ER, you watch, you're like, oh, that's not, no. <laughs> There's so many things that are not right. Like, yeah, you kind of got the broad strokes right, but no one would do that. And so when I watch this, I have the, a different view. Like, oh my God, this is exactly how this works. <laughs> it's playing out exactly how this happens. And I'm reminded of Danielle and Nick. It's happening exactly the same. We could watch that season side by side and it would be identical to this. And what will, because I, I, I found myself about to say the following and then I remembered, I said this exact same thing with Nick, that what often will happen is that right now in my book, he's he's trying and he's not making it, he's not helping, but on average, he's doing a good enough job. There's so much more he needs to do, but he's not making it a lot worse. But over time, if he continues to be accused and attacked without any awareness or apology, for, you know, like the next day, hopefully she says, I still stand by what I said about the twirling and the commenting on her body and stuff like that's no go. But I'm sorry that I kind of went a little far last night, but I stand by what I said and my hurt was rational, but I think I was particularly tired or triggered or something and I took it a little too far. If she says that, then great, but she probably won't. I hope she does, but if she doesn't, then he wakes up the next morning and it's like, well, hopefully that doesn't happen again, but he's hurt and he's scared because it happened. It's like, I'm being accused. I'm be she does, you know, I was just saying maybe earlier, she's saying these really grandiose things. He's like blanket statements. You never were with me. You don't love me. I feel nothing. I mean, she didn't say that directly, but it's like, I don't feel a connection at all. He would be, it would be strange if he didn't feel some like, what is happening? Like she doesn't see reality the same way I do. And nothing that I'm doing is registering with her. And she's so quick to just fall out of love with me over what? Now I'm scared. Now I'm hurt. Okay. But given his way, he probably won't say anything, then the next time she's triggered, which will happen, and she goes after him in this way, he'll have, he'll have less patience, and it'll compound on the pain and the anxiety. He'll be shorter or more avoidant, like, what are we doing here, and walks away or something. Or that's not what happened, you know, and, and, and less, like right now he's, he's like, what's happening? Uh, no, what's happening? He's trying, he's trying his best. You know, he still sees her in a good light and is trying to help. But if this continues, then he will get worse and he'll be responsible for that. And he could make it better and he needs to do what he can do to make it better. But if he doesn't, then it'll just, 
it'll just spin out of control. It'll be a mutual erosion of any goodwill and love in this relationship. And um, I'd have to tell you, as a therapist, it, it's hard. It's really hard to watch because one, you know, this might be something. And I always say this, but I, I really want to drive it home that this is this is an easy fix in therapy. This could take. I could therapists in my camp could fix this so quickly. I mean, not like completely, but we could easily repair this moment at the very least. But what happens is that people wait 20 years, they come in and they have like literally millions of moments like this. And we have to uh, untangle all that and repair for all that. I'm not denigrating anybody, but it, it's harder. With this, it would, it's just so easy. And then with a little bit of maintenance, maybe once a month in therapy of like, okay, are you following those principles? Are you do you have a checklist when you enter into that bad feeling? Are you saying certain things? Are you avoiding other kinds of things? Are you paying attention to your partner in this way? It, it's it's so easy. You know, there are much harder things in couple therapy than this. And to just watch it happen and to see people in pain, it's just so, it's a lot of distress. And I know this is happening all the time and all the pain and agony. And then and people walk away and go like, ugh. Maybe I'm terrible or people are terrible. And then the kids, you know, they suffer as well. It, it's just, it's, there's so much pain and I'm watching it. And I just want to, I just want to, I just want someone to go in there and help them. Hey, bud. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging how I felt. I, I didn't feel loved by you. I didn't feel like, like I felt like I was inconveniencing you every time I like walked You're up to you. You're not inconvenienced. I want to be around you. And I don't know. But that could be an indication of what I was talking about in an earlier video about working models of self and other, that for preoccupied people, generally speaking, it doesn't always work out this way because people aren't this simple, but typically as the child is experiencing inadequate parenting uh, with, you know, with preoccupation, the person concluded that they're not lovable and that other people are the promised land. So they're always trying to get to those other people. I'll be happy if I can just get someone to love me. And they don't have any inner resources. And as soon as there's a question mark of love from someone, they plummet and they just feel like they're worthless, right? And the way that she's talking is uh, along those lines. You know, she's saying, it just seems like you think of me as a piece of shit, really, is what she's saying. And you know, we don't know because we, we just saw an edited version. We're not in her shoes, but it did not look that way at all. You could argue that when he was... Uh, talking to AD for a while, that a lot of people would be hurt by that. But the rest of the time, before the AD thing, he's hugging her and kissing her and all those things. <laughs> and then after the AD thing, she, in terms of the edit, was blowing him off. No eye contact, just, you know, and he was trying to inter interact with her, but she was just not, you know, looking at him. So to narrativize and it probably feels this way to her that well let's rewind it, it was she i felt I, I didn't feel loved by you i didn't feel like like i felt like i was and it's not hard to imagine the transference here right that when children are being inadequately parented sometimes they will come to this conclusion i'm inconveniencing my parents i'm a burden on my parents and that just gets transferred to your partner inconveniencing you every time I like walk You're up not to inconvenience. You. I want to be around you. I love being around you. I, I'm so grateful to be on this trip with you. I I just need you I, to hear me out. You know, I, I hear you I'm out. I'm not trying to like you don't Okay. She's, it's, it's not perfect by any means, but she's, it's not as bad as it could be. It, it, it's, it's, it's manageable. Like I would say Danielle in terms of what we saw, that was a lot more reactivity. It's very similar to that, but she still has eye contact. She isn't raising her voice. She's not in a fetal position in the closet. So she uh, might be able to pull out of this. I don't think when I purposely walked over to you and Amy. And I want to be clear, if I'm right about this hypothesis, which I would have no way of knowing, it's not as if Chelsea says, I'm making a choice to be a jerk face. No, no, no. It's completely involuntary. The choice is, do I go to therapy or not? That's the choice. 
and no, Laura. I love that, but like because did you I wanted not to read like the room though. Like these are all people that we dated. You know, like it wasn't yeah. just like random friends, and that made me sad. It like hurt. It really hurt. Okay, it, it, she's still. Uh, uh, but this is much better. She's, she's sort of dipping into a better zone. You know, the crying, it hurt. That's great. Just say that. Just say it hurt. It really hurt. And she, he says, I'm sorry. I don't ever, I don't, I don't ever want to make you feel sad. Okay. Just a little tip here. If she wants, if she will allow it, just sit next to her and hug her and kiss her. The the magic that does on our emotions and our body and our physiology is unprecedented. It's better than cocaine. It will change your life if you can get that. And she will regulate in all likelihood. She'll feel better, deep breath, start to return to equilibrium. And then she can start to think more clearly about exactly what happened. The longer he waits to do that, the longer she's in this zone of, of pain and, and disconnection. But he could be concerned right now. She's saying a lot of really stark things. Like, I, I, I feel, what did she say? So I, you know, I feel no connection. And, of course, all the blame, right? So he has a reason to, uh, to he's managing pretty well. But like Nick did, Nick handled it pretty well in the beginning, too. And then... Uh, I think Nick's, because uh, Nick seemed like he had a, an avoidant tendency as well, and it was exacerbated by the pattern. And so uh, it's just hard to watch. And I do. I do. I love you. I love you with my entire heart. And that's why I'm having this conversation why are you... with you. Because it hurt. Well, like that. I, I get if it hurts. So I think he's starting to shut down, which is interesting because as soon as she started to return to equilibrium, I think that's when all of his pain started to come forward. And now I think he's starting to, I think he's starting to shut down. And I don't think he knows why he's upset. Uh, he doesn't typically articulate it. And I would imagine he's upset the implication of like, so if I have a conversation with any woman, this is going to happen. Now... You know, from the outside, it's like, well, it's not conversation. It's it's what you said and the physicality of the conversation, which isn't necessarily a high crime, but you can avoid that pretty easily. So, so I I think that for him, he would feel concerned about what's going to happen in the future, and also concerned about earlier. You said you didn't feel any connection. What does that mean? And also concerned about. So at any moment, I could be like completely hurting you and I wouldn't know it. I would have no way of knowing that that was happening. And you also like completely discounted like a lot of really wonderful things, experiences that we had at the party, you and me. So I think that's what's happening for him. And I think he's starting to shut down. Babe, I love you. I'm having this conversation with you because I, I love you too. I, I just think that I, I just thought that was a given. Okay, so she did a great thing <laughs> by reaching out that will, I'm guessing, help pull him out. Uh, but it doesn't resolve it. And for both of them, unless this is resolved, when this happens again, which I will put a lot of money on it happening again, it'll just pick up where they left off. I wouldn't have asked you to marry me. I know, but you have to understand, like, that it hurt me. Thought, look in your eyes and tell Yeah, get, yeah. Jimmy, get up, get away from that. <laughs> I thought that. Uh, uh, just tell her, just reiterate it again. But she's doing great. She's like, it hurt me. And she, eye contact, giving him a chance. There's no accusation. And maybe in her head there's an accusation, but she's not highlighting that. She's like, it hurt. It hurt. And she's crying. Provokes that. It's great. It's good. It's promising. How I felt about you, and not only how I feel about you, but trying to prove to you, you know, like... I wouldn't be having this conversation with you if I didn't give a crap. I know that. I know okay. you care about me. 
I do. I, I love you. I feel like you're questioning that I love you. Right, that's what I thought. Because she is. Majorly. So, yeah. Yeah. And he's right. But this isn't the time. <laughs> this is not the time. He's right, but this isn't the time. Okay, what do you want me to do? I told you that my feelings were hurt. What, what else do you want me to say? So, she could do well by saying, okay, yeah, I, I, I was triggered. I, I exaggerated. I, I said some harsh things. I should have just stuck to what I'm saying now. And I, I don't mean those things, and I'm sorry. So I think that would help if she said that. But she either still feels that way, which I don't think, or she doesn't know how to say those things. I don't know. I don't understand where this is going. I'll take a step back. The this is getting this is this is making me mad. Okay, I think he was still workable, but I think because of her worries, and maybe she's reading it right, but I think she's not reading it correctly. I think she's starting to feel like the floor is falling out under, from underneath her, and her emotions are starting to spiral, and she's not going to know what to do. And he's not necessarily equipped to be able to help her pull out of that. And she has never been in therapy before. I don't know. Do, do we know? Did she say? Uh, I don't have any. I don't have any uh, notes about her being in therapy. So, without any kind of awareness, yeah, it, it, she's just going to be flapping in the wind. And they don't have their cell phones, so her regular support system is unavailable. So like Danielle did, this could, this could be actually a concern. If I were there as a clinician and I had the power, I would, I would absolutely do a lot of things right now, <laughs> you know, mainly because there are some signs that she might have destructive coping that I, I don't know that, but I wouldn't be surprised. So at the very least, like that sort of triage, but also just helping the two of them understand the context so that they can say, oh, I didn't, we were speaking cross purposes. And so, because what I see is two people that desperately love each other and are desperately worried about losing the other person. That's what I see. So how are they in a place where they're both going, I don't think this person loves me. How does that happen? Okay, I'm telling you that my feelings were hurt. You said hurtful comments. You made me feel uncomfy. Okay. So just take we'll it. I see, I see the cloud. And she's getting hostile, so just take it. She has a, a fair request, which is, I'm just sticking to my feelings, and I just want you to accept it. And he did earlier. So, at least to my memory, or at least indirectly. So, yeah. Yeah, this is... Uh, they almost pulled out of it. <laughs> they were almost out of it. And if this doesn't resolve soon and they go to bed in this state, you know, the, the, the limited amount of love and connection that they had developed, because they don't have time to develop much more than that, could be completely snuffed out. And no matter what they do, there's no way they can rekindle. That, that's not a comment. In regular life, this would happen on, you know, date five, and uh, you just stop dating the person. You just stop dating each other. Here, well, it's a little different. You're treating me unfair, actually. I love you. I love you too. I don't know, but there's this dynamic of her being pointed, hostile, it might be a word, but accusatory when he's not in the in the mode of like trying to convince her and he's just like uh then she reaches out now it could be that when he exhibits that vulnerability and i was actually hoping it's like oh he's being vulnerable and he's just talking about his feelings maybe that will provoke the humanness because if he didn't care he wouldn't feel his things he'd be like whatever so uh, it, it seemed it had that effect but it also could be a pattern that she was shown growing up that you attack and then you reconcile. You attack and then you reach out. You hurt someone and then you reassure them. You're both the harmer and the savior. 
Are you sure? I'll always tell you I love you. And then he walks away. Yeah. I think he's hurt and confused, and this isn't going to help her. So and I, I keep hoping. They keep having these moments up, and then this happens. So if this is how it ends, then uh, it's hard to imagine that they'd be able to pull out of this. All right, well, that's the end of that batch of episodes, and there's a number of four minutes left, and it's all previews that will spoil things, and I don't want it to be spoiled. So that does it for that episode. You probably know what happens because the episodes are probably out in your world, but they're not out in my world. So you know what happened, but I don't. But I'll find out, and I'll talk about it. And you will either be there with me or not. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll comment, and I'll read your comments, and you'll either see my reply or you won't. You know, there's a lot of chaos in the world. <laughs> I don't know, it's late. So, ugh, that was hard. Ugh, we can all do this, Sasha. Okay, shake it off. My wife loves me. I love her. We're not fighting. Everything's fine. I'm watching it. This is what I do after therapy sessions sometimes. I have to do this exact thing. Just like ground myself, detach, not detach, but differentiate. Uh, you know, I'm in it and I'm like involved because I got to do that in order to assess and help. And the consequence of that is I, through undifferentiation, will start to lose sight that it's not me. And so... I will have to re-differentiate afterwards. And so I'm, I'm doing that right now. You can do it too. And that all is a part of us taking care of ourselves because we deserve it. We really, really do.